everybody, thank you for joining Synthetic Intelligence Forum online. My name is Vic and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, an excellent session today uh, by Professor Jor uh, Jörg Northhoff from the University of Ottawa who's going to talk to us about neurosciences and computational intelligence. It's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome Professor Northhoff to the stream. And uh, Jörg, I'd like you to just uh, introduce yourself a little bit for our audience and then I'll share your slides and then we'll uh, click through the slides. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, psychiatrist and philosopher and I'm, uh, my research is located at the interface between brain and mind. And we're also looking for understanding the brain, how it's related to the mind and in psychiatric disorders. And for that, one more towards artificial intelligence. Uh, maybe we can learn something from artificial intelligence and vice versa. Maybe artificial intelligence can learn something from the brain. And you will see both directions in my talk. So my talk is about uh, time is of essence and what AI can learn from the brain and vice versa. How can we use AI to augment the brain? So one of the main ideas, and you see this already here. So on the left, actually, uh, you might... Uh, Know this is the Frankenstein movie in the 80s uh, of last century shot, highly recommended to download because they basically sketch some of the fictive scenarios, but something goes awfully wrong there. So it's very funny. Take a look at that movie. So on the right, you see, I just published a recent book in Italy, uh, The Code of the Brain, uh, the, the Code of Time. Why is time important? And time is very important because the main idea is here that Time links the code of the brain to the rest of the world and the mind. So meaning for mental features like consciousness, sense of self, psychotic disorders, maybe the time of the brain is key. And one of the things you see this here in the middle, I think one of the key problems of current AI is despite all its progress, and I will point that out, is that the agents do not have an intrinsic time. And you will better understand that in the following of my talk. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you see I point out uh, humans and their brain. So what can we do? We are very good in doing different kinds of tasks. We can do go, we can compose and listen to music, we can nurture our little kids, and even we learn driving, uh, maybe the self-driving cars. We don't need that anymore, but still you see here, uh, early practice in car driving. And all these are completely different abilities with completely different timescales and a mixture of different timescales. We can all do that. So meaning humans and their brains are very good in generalizing across different tasks. Next slide, please. How about artificial agents? So they may be just good in, they're good in, particular tasks. I mean, here you thought I point out the Go, uh, the Alpha Go, and they uh, excel humans. So they're better than humans. So meaning, however, they do not can do this, the other tasks. They are not as adaptive. So usually it's a relatively specifically tailored purpose. Next slide. However, when you're good in something, you may be bad in something else. So nothing is for free. And I think that's very important to consider for both brain and current and eye. What can they do? I pointed out. What can they not do? So that may be, as always, when you look into nature, a trade-off. Next slide, please. So what's... The trade-off in humans, we have an error problem. We are good in various tasks, but in all tasks, we are not perfect. We have errors, yeah? So they build in errors. Uh, we have errors in the go. Uh, we have errors in our music listening. We perceive wrong things. We make errors in driving and so on. And that exactly these errors in particular tasks were artificial agents. Uh, excel us and much better. However, what humans can do, and that I point here in the lower right, humans can navigate and flexibly adapt to different contexts in the environment. So we currently undergo a major change in our environment, 
meaning the COVID. So some people, including me, have to stay all day at home, cannot travel, cannot go abroad, and so on and so on. So somehow we can adapt to that. Of course, the emphasis is here on somehow. Yeah. So we are very flexible, adapt to different contexts in the environment. And when you look at the evolutionary history, even larger scale, that's exactly what happened, different climate conditions and so on. And we are still there and we adapt to that. We have four different conditions, uh, summer, winter, uh, fall and spring. We adapt to that. Yeah. And more immediate context, we adapt to that, cultural context and so on. Yeah. However, that comes with a price that we have errors. Yeah, uh, sometimes we misperceive things, we make errors in the alpha go, uh, in the go, or in the chess, and so on. So, yeah, next slide. Whereas the problem in agents may be that they cannot generalize. They cannot, they can only do one particular or a small limited number of tasks very well, but not completely different tasks. So meaning, um, they good in gen uh, they have a generalization problem and you all know this uh, on a one specific task and they cannot really navigate within a flexible environmental context of course that is about to change but so far that's a problem and that's a key problem so they cannot adapt and flexibly change to different environmental contexts so that's why I put a red cross here so the world and behind the world, it was originally uh, considered as a PPT here, but uh, you see the agent. Next slide, please. So let me uh, specify that a little bit. So you have the degree of interpolation, let's say very concrete in machine learning, that you have test data must be related to training data in order for the agent to act on test data. So there it's clear AI already uh, surpassed humans are uh, far beyond humans. For the degree of extrapolation, when test data are not related to training data, but agent can still act on test data, the humans uh, accept. It's clear that's where we still bet. So the question is, how can we improve the humans in the interpolation? And how maybe we can improve the agents in the extrapolation? Maybe that will be necessary for the agents to better help the humans on the interpolation. Next slide, please. So the question is, how can we solve the error problems of humans and maybe the generalization problem of AI? So that's the uh, key question. And that's basically the, the framework of my talk. And that's also the background of the title of my talk that maybe AI can learn something from the brain in order to help the brain. Next slide. So the main issue and one key feature in that I assume it's time and uh, what do I mean by time I will come back to that so time might be a candidate where I say maybe time could really solve or address the human error problem and minimize the generalization problem of AI so however and here we already see and that's a basic assumption on the side of the brain the time may be really provide a code which is key for the brain's processing and encoding of inputs. So this is a hypothesis we are really strongly testing now that the temple features of the brain. And I will show you a little bit into that uh, throughout my talk. However, before we need to somewhat clarify what on earth is time because you have as probably many conceptions about time as people talking about time. Next slide, please. So, but what on earth is time? So, as I said, you have different notions of time that almost that strongly, of course, leads to somewhat into philosophy and uh, physics, particularly in physics. And let me just go back. Next slide. So, what is time? Let's go back a little bit, very shortly, a little detour to the ancient uh, Greeks. Uh, and there you had particular Kronos as the father of time. You see here's a, here's a typical uh, picture, Kronos with a, with a harp. Uh, and Kronos particular stands for temporal continuity. 
longer stretches of time. So in the case of Cronus, you have basically a flowing river and it flows continuously. Uh, that's basically this temporal continuity with fluctuations. That's the time of Cronus. I will come back to that. Next slide. However, next slide. There was, you know, there was not only Cronus, but there was also Kairos. So that's uh, uh, two words for time in ancient uh, Greece. So Kronos, and you see here on the Kronos, it's more about the stretching of time. Yeah, it's measured in minutes, it's longer, if you want to put it into uh, uh, frequencies, it's a slower frequency. Time is continuously, continuous is like a flowing river, it's a stream, uh, and that time is, for instance, very well manifest in what on the psychological level is often described as a stream of consciousness, William James, a famous a psychologist at the turn of the 18th, 19th century. Uh, uh, sorry, 19th, 20th century. Yeah, um, and here it's the, the typical example is imagine a watch. Yeah? For Kairos, it's much more discrete points in time. So it's moments in time. Now you see me doing this. Now, in another snapshot, you see me doing this or that. So that's in the time of Kairos. The time is basically chopped up into different snapshots. Imagine like a window. Yeah, it has certain uh, frameworks, but not much. Yeah, uh, but not others. So it's discrete moments in time. So now the question is, which kind of time holds in the case of the brain? So obviously there has been a long, and I don't want to go into that, a long philosophical discussion about time in philosophy and physics. And basically it really oscillates between these two extreme poles. There's what is called presentism, block view of time. It goes back to letter, it goes back to Einstein and others. So it's it's I I, I don't go into that. Let me show the next slide. Yeah. So here now, um, what about artificial agents? So their time, they really don't have an intrinsic time in that sense. They more side with Kairos. So you can see they have discrete points in time, a discrete, a limited number of moments operating at discrete points in time. And that's also, they are good in particular tasks where you have one of two time scales. So usually I know it's not usually done to deconstruct or to view tasks through time scales. But when you become aware of that, that certain behavior, for instance, now uh, I move, or you, you can see, yeah, I move now very slowly. Yeah, now I move my head very fast. So these are different time scales. If your brain cannot record the fast time scale and the slow time scale, the way I speak, then it will miss the slow input. For instance, it can only put the fast. So meaning your time scales may be important, and that's already a key message, how your agent or slash your brain can interact with the time scales of the environment. If you present very fast, when you listen to music and the, uh, let's say, classical uh, music, you have different time scales. You have slow and fast time scales uh, side by side uh, in terms of so more engineering language, you have slow and fast frequencies side by side. So meaning we are dealing with very complex inputs, temporally highly sophisticated inputs from our environment the artificial agent sample them only in discrete points in time and usually in a very probably restricted time scales. So, and that's what makes them good. They have one particular time scale, they cannot mix it up with other, and they're really good in the task, which probably corresponds to their time scales. So that's more sort of the time of Kairos. And what is important here, and I've wrote it here on the right again, that this uh, agent has no intrinsic time. So it has no time which by itself operates on its own, independent of the time of the external input slash the external environment. 
So the time of this agent is completely determined by the time of the external input, by the timing and the frequencies of the external input. But it has not an own internal time. Yeah, and you see that is probably one of the key differences, at least at this point in time. So you see, at this point in time, to the break. Next slide, please. Yeah. yeah. Here, you see the brain does both. The brain has short time scales and long time scales. When you overlap them, there is somehow a temporal continuity. And you see, I uh, indicated that by the arrow. So when you overlap, you see these uh, green uh, uh, circles. And these are different moments in time. And they somewhat overlap. They're coupled with each other. And that provides you with a certain temporal con uh, continuum. So and that's probably due to the N has a multiple time scales. And I will show you uh, empirical support for that in the following. So the question is, the brain has a multitude of time scales, not only one time window, multiple. You will see that in the, in the data. So and when you put them all together, that amounts to a very interesting mixture of temporal continuity and temporal discontinuity, meaning the slower time scales, the longer time windows, provide a certain temporal continuity, whereas the shorter time scale provide a temporal discontinuity. And these are nested within each other, like the Russian dolls, where you see the smaller doll rusted, uh, 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 nested within the next larger one, and so forth. Same here. The faster time scale is nested within the next uh, slower one, and then so forth. And that gives you a very complex uh, amalgam of different time scales. And the idea is that maybe this, the number of different time scales, may be a key for the brain's adaptive and uh, generalizing capacity. Next slide, please. So here I show you a little bit from our brain research. Uh, what we are doing. So we consider the brain really in terms of time and space. I neglect the space here. And we consider it a whole brain approach. So we don't single out one particular time scale, one particular region. Yeah. So instead, we want to see how is, let's say, the, the organization and structure of the different uh, time scales across the brain. You can see here. So how can we measure them? So if you have, uh, let's say, you have a subject in the fMRI scanner or brain scanner or an EEG where you can make a record electrical activity, electroencephalography, uh, you have a very high, particularly in the EEG, a sampling rate. Um, and then so you have a certain number of time points and then how you connect these time points. One way to measure them is what is called the autocorrelation function. You see that here in the slide. You see on the uh, y, on the x-axis, you see the number of legs. So it's basically the shift in time point. And now you correlate each time point with each other. So meaning, let's say you correlate the activity at time point one with the activity at time point two, at time point three, time point four, time point five. And then you do the same for time point two. So you correlate the activity of time point two with the activity at time point three, time point four, five, six, and so forth. And that's what is called the lex. And then uh, you get sort of the strength of the correlation. You get what is called an autocorrelation function. And of course, you expect that, that time points which are more closely related to each other uh, that's a high degree of correlation because they're more similar, whereas time points which are more distant from each other show a lower correlation, meaning with the number of, uh, with the distance in the legs, with the legs, you see, you see a decreasing autocorrelation curve. Yeah, it's the same that you have, well, it's not always the case, but let's say a closer, a more likelihood of a closer relationship with your neighbor um, than with the person living 50 kilometers. Uh, away. 
So I, I know it's not always the case with the neighbors, but yeah. So that's what you have. And that's basically what is called the autocorrelation window, a function and window, and then you can determine the correlation, the degree of correlation at 50% uh, at the, or at, at zero. So I don't want to bother you with the details. And then you can uh, see here down there is a the brain. Uh, and you see the different colors. The different colors mean uh, different time scales. So this is work done by Mashat Gole Zorki, who's really the, the the leading person in my group about these uh, time scales. And he also uh, intends, you will see more figures by him, uh, intends to implement that maybe in uh, uh, in networks and artificial agent. So um, and you see. Uh, here you see, for instance, you see in the lower, you see brains, you see it from the from the outside, the upper two brains are from the outside, what is called lateral, or you see brain from the inside, basically from the medial side when you chop them into half, it's the medial view, and you see the more yellow, uh, the high, the longer the, the time scales, the longer the autocorrelation window, meaning you have a larger uh, time window, it's difficult here. Yeah, you have a larger time window in the yellow regions, whereas in the more red regions, you have a much smaller time window like this. And uh, you see already the brain is anything but homogeneous with respect to its different time scales. You see, uh, uh, you have here particularly the, uh, uh, here the uh, left region, the visual cortex out there here in the back. Uh, you see it's very red and it has a shorter time scale. Uh, maybe the next slide. Yeah, here you see that basically again, and this is already, these time scales are already when you don't do anything, meaning in the resting. We call this in imaging uh, neuroscience a resting state. It's not a true resting state because if you were really a true rest by zero, your brain would be dead. But basically when you don't do any specific task. So independent of any external input, your brain already shows all these different time scales. And you see this again here, you see in the lower, you see in particular there in the middle, the orange is longer time scales. Yeah? So meaning you have an array of different time scales, short and long, and you have a quite variation in that. So this is perfect to process the different time scales of the environment. Yeah? However, as we know, like for instance in psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, they might confuse the time scales. So then, of course, you have a problem. So as I said, nothing is for free. So you see our brain, even in the resting state, without any external input, it has already different time scales. Short, long, and you see quite a mosaic. Uh, that's, again, uh, next slide. This is uh, from a paper which uh, Mershat uh, Goldeshock has already mentioned, published just, just very recently. Um, so here... He made the point, maybe, uh, as we know from physics, time and space are somewhat related. Maybe they're also related in the brain. That meaning that we have a certain temporal hierarchy of intrinsic time scales converge with this particular form of organization, which is called corporiphy. So this was just published in Nature Communication Biology. And he is the first author, you see that. And maybe let me tell you what we mean by spatial corporiphy organization. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you see this. So here you see a core, lower right. You see a core, and within the core, the different nodes within the core have a very strong connection with each other. So you see a lot of blue lines. They're intrinsically connected, what is called core-core connections. They're very tight. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you have the periphery, and you see uh, there the periphery up there, you see the nodes within the periphery are not as strongly connected with each other. Yeah, barely any blue lines among the nodes in the, corpor in the periphery. And also between core and periphery, there are not so many. So this is a typical organization called periphery, which is not specific to the brain, but which also occurs basically in all kinds of organizations. It comes originally from social science, and it seems to be the most robust and efficient and stable organization type. You see it in different physical systems. You see it, for instance, the airport hubs. You have certain cores, uh, of course, all before COVID, not these days. 
Um, yeah, so you have certain peripheral airports and you have certain core airports like Paris, London, the core airports of Frankfurt in Germany or here Toronto in Canada or New York where you have a certain peripheral, more peripheral airports and unfortunately Ottawa is a more peripheral airport. Yeah, it has some connection with Toronto, but not as, as many. So that's uh, a typical organization. And it seems as more and more evidence that the brain also has an analogous organization among its different regions. Next slide. Yeah, and that's what you can see here. Uh, you see here the uh, time scales you see in blue. Uh, the periphery regions in the case of the brain. And that means basically the primary input regions like sensory visual cortex, motor, uh, motor cortex, primary output regions or auditory cortex. So basically regions which process external inputs. And then these are called unimodal regions. And then you have, and these are at the periphery of the brain, literally at the periphery outside here. And then in the deep middle, uh, is basically what is called the core regions. Is also you might have heard the default mode network, and these are in in red. And you see here he has the time scales. Meshat uh, sketched the time scales here, and you see in blue the uh, periphery, the unimodal regions, so your input regions, and in red the core regions in the middle of the brain or the default mode network. And you see that the time scales are significantly longer in the transmodal regions in the red stuff. You see it's the asymmetry, and here on the y-axis you have the uh, length of the time scales uh, called the uh, autocorrelation window, and you see it's much longer in the red than in the blue. So now you might say, why are these time scales relevant? So, and I already hinted upon that, we assume based on various kinds of data that they're really related to the processing of inputs, either internal inputs from the body or external inputs from the environment. And that makes it really relevant for artificial agent because it depends how your agent processes the input it receives. Next slide, please. So take home message, regions in the core have a longer time scale, regions in the outer periphery have a more, uh, a shorter time scale. So now why is that relevant, particular for, uh, 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 mental uh, features. So this was uh, work, sorry, I did it wrong here. This was work done by Anne-Marie Walsh in my group. And she linked the time scales to our sense of self, self-consciousness. And what she observed, you see it's a typical autocorrelation window here. And she observed in the uh, upper right and in the lower part, she observed that particularly the longer your time scales, the longer your autocorrelation window, the higher your sense of self your private self-consciousness as we measured with psychological scale. And this was without any input processing. It was just pure what we call resting state. So this is very interesting that the length of your time scale seemed to be related with your uh, strengths or your degree in your sense of self. So meaning uh, in the longer time scale means of course, temple continuity, yeah? So maybe if your self is related so the longer time scales, particularly also here in these transmodal regions, you see there the brain in the middle. Uh, that may be really that the self is at the extreme end of the temporal continuity and provides stability and uh, can probably then also better process slow internal input rather than ex uh, faster external input. Next slide, please. Yeah, here you see the same. Now, now here, this was done by Federico Filio. So he then tested, are these time scales are really related to input processing? And what he found, so this is again, you see upper right, the autocorrelation window and uh, uh, lower right, you see the, the autocorrelation window in sleep. So very interesting what happened in sleep, your time scales get much longer. So you see the uh, autocorrelation window increases from uh, awake state to in the different sleep stages in one to N3. And you see it continuously increases, meaning your brain becomes very slow. In sleep, your brain becomes very slow. So your time scales become much longer. Interestingly, in dream, the time scales become again a little shorter, REM, uh, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep on the very right. So that is very interesting. So that again suggests maybe your time scales 
have an impact on our on our mental features, the sense of self and your consciousness. Because as you know, during sleep, and not during dreams, but during a particular N3 sleep, you lose your consciousness. So that suggests a key role for the time scales in input processing and mental features. Next slide, please. Yeah. So that's basically if your brain becomes too slow, your time scales become too long, you cannot process external inputs anymore because then it's basically everything is just one big soup. It's probably like a very extremely foggy weather where you cannot see anything. That's what I assume that what these people experience or no longer experience is just one big soup. Everything is the same, no difference anymore. Because if you don't have the different time scales in your brain anymore, it's just they're so long that everything falls through the cracks. You cannot make a difference between the different time scales in the environment. So your time, basically, if you want to say so, your temporal continuity, discontinuity, mosaic of that breaks down. That's what I try to indicate. And that breakdown has a serious consequence. You apparently seem to lose consciousness. Next slide. Yeah. So why? And this is, again, a, a figure from, from Meshat Golosoki, where he uh, is a paper submitted about intrinsic time scale. So why are these time scales so important? And you see here, I put an arrow on the most important part of this figure because these time scales seem to be very important in the stochastic matching between the time scales of the environment and the time scales of the brain. So meaning the time scales really provide our interface with the environment. That's a temple interface and that's pure stochastics, of course. Uh, but that uh, according to the timing. So meaning if you have a wide array of time scales in your brain, you might have a higher likelihood of matching and corresponding to a wider array of time scales in the environment. So you see the, the arrow is here really put on the matching. And you see already that I think is one of the key difference to agents. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here, uh, this is a hypothetical figure, uh, partially based on data. You see uh, different kinds of brain. You see in the upper is the mouse brain, cat brain, a monkey brain, and human brain. So, and of course, the first thing you see is the size of the brain. It's hugely different, remarkably different. And it's a big question why uh, our brain is such a big size. There was recently a paper on, 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 on genes, certain genes, encoding the size of the brain. So here, maybe the larger brain gives you a wider array of different regions and slash of different time scales. So here you see on the right, you see uh, Meshat plotted the, 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 the different time scales. Uh, and you also see that we still inherit the time scales of the mice, of the mouse brain, but we have additional time scales. So you see the humans uh, have the blue time scales, then you see the monkeys. So this is what you see. So you have a wider array of different time scales, meaning we can connect to our environment in a much more fine grained and sophisticated way than, for instance, the mouse or the cat. And that may be why their behavior is more stereotypical and not as adaptive as the human behavior. It may be adapted to a very limited number of time scales within the context, but not to such a wider array. Next slide, please. And remember that this is a key uh, figure. Next one here, this is just basically to illustrate that the time scales really provides a transition maybe to real world behavior. Next slide. Yeah, so now I come back to my initial questions. Um, do the time scales of the brain, the time of the brain, provide an answer to the error problem and the generalization problem? So here you can see uh, we have time scales, but remember we had the error problem. Maybe our number of time scales are, of course, limited. And you see this, for instance, here in the lower right, the black uh, stuff. So you see, again, the different time scales. You see the cat brain and the human brain on the right there. And uh, compared to your input, um, it's, it's unfortunately mask here, that the black is the degree where the brain's time scales or the cat's time scales differ from the time scales in the environment. So meaning that is the error because that's a time scale humans cannot process. I give you an example. 
I give you the example of bet, which is highly discussed in philosophy. What is it like to be bad? Thomas Nagel, 1974. Bats can process ultrasonar waves. They have their own time scales, which humans cannot process. Meaning the little black thing uh, on the lower part there uh, is uh, really related. Uh, that's the ultrasonar wave which humans cannot process because we don't have the proper time scales in our brain to process ultrasonar waves. Uh, next. Uh, and that might be one cause of the error problem. So now the question is, can AI help the human brain and its error problems? So the idea here is maybe AI can learn from the brain. So it's very almost paradoxical. Uh, AI can help the brain by learning from the brain and then extending beyond the brain. So one, two things is what we imagine, maybe built in different timescales and different windows of continuities, of temporal continuities into your uh, agent, for instance, in the different deep uh, uh, networks, into the different layers. And then you can ultimately that you match the timescale which you build into your agent uh, with the target time scales in your environment. So you see this, uh, this is again a uh, figure by uh, uh, Goloshoki, Goloshoki. And you see here we have the agent and maybe build in the time scale which, which you expect or want your agent to match with the environment and its respective time scales. So next slide, please. Yeah, so here you see upper now is the human brain. Now let's say you have an artificial brain or an artificial agent, let's say artificial brain, maybe that extends the time scale. You see the, uh, in purple, you see the blue is the uh, human brain time scales and in purple are uh, uh, time scales of an art artificial brain, which I added onto the human time scale. So that would be really, uh, an extension of the time scales of the brain, and that maybe augment the brain's adaptive and generalizing capacity and ultimately minimize the error problem. What? Because that would enable us a differentiated, more fine grained at extending uh, the time scales. Yeah, next slide, please. So now you say, why shall we use it? So here you see this is a figure and uh, work by Narek uh, uh, Barbarian, uh, Barbarian in my group. And we sketched this, and this is a paper which is about to be submitted, so that we, if we augment the brain's intrinsic time scales, maybe we can extend, have a more fine-grained and maybe also more long-term decision-making, particularly in terms of COVID, you wish sometimes a more long-term decision-making, uh, which apparently the human brain is very limited. Yeah, but that might uh, then also uh, improve the current situation. Maybe improves the prediction. I'm here in Canada. Weather prediction is a weather forecast is a nightmare because it's always wrong. It's unbelievable. Even when you when you look into your uh, the weather forecast in the evening before, I usually like to run very early in the morning at five six, and you look at uh, nine ten when I go to bed, and it's often wrong. It's unbelievable. Not even five six hours. Uh, we can predict because apparently we don't understand the uh, dynamic of the weather forecast and probably because we don't have the time scales. Same with seismic earth waves. Uh, uh, um, earthquake prediction is really hampered by that we cannot get into the longer time scales, which are needed for seismic earth waves. Yeah. So, and here I said maybe we can uh, improve that by extending our time scales. That's basically what this figure is about. Next slide, please. Yeah, one uh, example which came up in the discussion uh, in, a, in a recent podcast, it's very interesting, plants. Plants don't move for us, but they move. But they move on a time scale which we cannot capture. So for us, plants don't move. However, in reality, plants move. Yeah. So now if we have an agent where we could augment the brain's time scales and stretch them towards the slow limit, then maybe we are able to see plants moving. Yeah. So that 
would would be one possible way just to illustrate what I mean by augmenting or extending the brain time scale. Next slide, please. By coming towards the end. Uh, another uh, thing, another application which is very much to my heart is mental disorders. So mental disorders are probably you all know schizophrenia, but there's also what is called depression, and not it's not just a depression when uh, uh, little thing is a really major depressive disorder when you want to kill yourself and you have to see a psychiatrist. Currently, we do trial and error in the treatment, and we don't really know what is going on with these uh, patients. And that's a real problem. So we don't have proper treatment. I know that AI is a lot used to use the big data and to make diagnostic prediction. However, I would argue that is still uh, hampered by the lack of insight of the mechanism of these disorders. So one of the ideas is that maybe in these, and we are currently work hard on this particular, uh, Anne-Marie Wolf in my group, on investigating time scales in, for instance, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is when you have hallucinations, when you hear voices, and delusions, when, for instance, uh, maybe in a couple of hours you still hear my you still hear my voice. Uh, that's not a good sign. Then you might want to call me because I'm a psychiatrist too. So, uh, so the time scales. Maybe there's a mess up in the time scales in schizophrenia. So now imagine if you have an agent. You know the mechanism. You can provide proper input through the agent to the timescales of the schizophrenia patients. That's what we try to envision here. And then maybe that the patient can properly uh, connect with other people. Because the main problem in schizophrenia is usually they don't have the connection, the intuitive connection, the alignment, the proper input processing with the environmental context. So they feel isolated, they cannot connect to others, they cannot read it. And maybe if you can, and that and that what I try to indicate here with the red arrows, that the connection can be reestablished. And then, of course, you can communicate, you don't feel as isolated. So that's one of the ideas and my hope that we can use some artificial agents then to augment these patient uh, timescales in a very specific way. Yeah, and of course, the devil lies in the detail, but we're working on that. Next slide. So I just sketch you a possible application. Yeah, uh, coming to the, to the last uh, slides, uh, the temporal augmenting agent, what exactly is this? TAA can help humans in their decision-making prediction alignment to the environment and provide hopefully novel therapy to uh, mental disorders. And you see the paradoxical thing here, uh, here I put some words into the agent's mouth. My time scale can extend yours. For that, I learn from your brain. So you see there's a double direction, um, and that I hope that can augment and extend our real-time and real-world behavior. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, coming back to our initial problems. So you see, remember the generalization problem. AI has a huge generalization problem, in particular in the degree of extrapolation. So meaning, I would at least in part make the point that time holds the key to address the human error problem, meaning to improve our capacity there. And at the same time, if we build in more time scales into the agent, maybe we can uh, decrease or minimize the generalization problems. Next slide, please. And so that's my last slide here. So you see that I try to sketch, we can learn from the brain that because it seems uh, there's increasing evidence that the time is the code for the brain and how it interacts with the environment, meaning in more neuroscientific term, input processing. And it might also be a, a shared feature, or I call this common currency, between brain and mental features. I indicated that for brain and self, brain and uh, consciousness, and as well as we see environmental context. And that's the important point. And that puts your temporal augmenting agent right as part of the environment. And it will exhibit then probably a point of view which currently it doesn't have. So it might then say, I have my own time and my intrinsic time scales, which usually match quite well with the targeted time scales environment, but not always. 
And therefore, I have a self with a point of view which allows me to navigate flexibly within the world. And ideally, flexibly navigating within the world then would also mean for the agent maybe to interact with humans to augment human types. That's sort of the, the basic idea, and I hope that's one of the lessons we can draw from the brain and hopefully implement in some agent. Thank you very much. And if you want, you can see more on my website as below. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jörg. That was a very thought provoking and a thoughtful talk. I appreciate that. There's a number of interesting questions. I, I do want to start perhaps with a question of my own. And this relates to a very interesting slide that I saw on autocorrelation and time lag. And, and you were uh, talking about sort of the difference in the cap capacity or the utilization of the brain at rest versus at uh, in active modes. And I was immediately thinking about optimization and convergence seeking and, and even uh, parameter search when you are trying to run these massive optimization type networks. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the questions I had uh, was, what if we take this kind of conceptual scaffolding that you have developed with your researcher research partners and we use that to inspect and to interrogate the computational machinery involved, for example, in reinforcement learning to maximize some kind of reward or in, in traditional deep learning to minimize some kind of loss. Um, what if we could identify these patterns of, of, of uh, latent idling or of dormant boosting and then we can really fine tune that computational machinery to maybe skip around that kind of uh, latent idling and focus more on that boosting then perhaps this could lead to better uh, utilization of the machinery but also uh, speed up convergence and perhaps have other benefits like numerical stability and things like that. So your thoughts on how we can take that conceptual scaffolding and apply that to the actual computational machinery involved in, in optimization convergence and parameter search yeah good question so the first thing I would look at the task itself so what kind of task you want the agent to do and then I don't look at the content of the task so what the uh, agent has to do but I look at the time scales yeah so I have a really a temporal view on task I do the same with cognitive tasks so I would look what are the time scales involved and then you see uh, what is the continuum of different times, the range of timescales involved, and then I would optimize the timescales of my agent accordingly. So then I would probably put in some, let's say, if you need longer timescales, you need delay. Yeah? Uh, temple delay, tasking, reward, you know all that. Yeah? The delay of the reward. And then let's see, and then you can probe that sort of in the behavior of the agent, how much it can uh, delay the reward. If the uh, agent uh, delays the reinforcement too long, it might be maladaptive too. So you need to figure that out, but that depends on the environmental context in which it interacts. So Very I would into in your different layers, different timescales. The problem is how to build in this temporal continuity or this autocorrelation function. Very interesting, Jürgen. I can totally see how working at a sub-symbolic level, as you just said, if you're not even focusing on the content of the task, that just makes it more applicable. So I, th I think that would be a great research uh, direction to sort of uh, follow. Uh, an interesting question here from one of our colleagues is, uh, is it possible to train the brain to recognize different environmental timescales and accordingly process sensory inputs at those timescales? Yeah, so definitely it can recognize different timescales. And that all the problem is to experimentally pass that apart because everything happens simultaneously. So one of the ideas which we're currently running that we have a multiple layers of thought, short and long, all at the same time. Yeah, and then of course, if you have certain environmental inputs, let's say more slower inputs, maybe your time scale go more towards the slower thoughts. Yeah, because that's basically your sensitivity. But if you have very fast input, then, of course, you probably more go to the faster thoughts and your brain becomes fast. In part, yeah, in part, it will remain stable. So there's always a discrepancy between the time scales of your environment and the brain. And that's probably why you have a certain subjectivity in your perception, yeah, or your sense of self. Thank you, uh, Jörg. There, here's another very interesting question from Gordon. Is there a minimum time that the brain cannot determine internally? Would there be a concept of latency or latency time inhibitors? Where does internal time become defined? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. So on psychology, there's sort of 
uh, the assumption that uh, three seconds is one optimal duration, but that looks very long because you're already in the quite slow frequency spectrum. So again, you probably, the actual biophysical range of time in the brain is not, human brain is not fully clear to me. We want to run a study with different species where we try to figure that out. Uh, internal time is basically the, the degree of temporal continuity, discontinuity, or let's make it more easy, the power spectrum in your brain's own activity, independent of any, any task. So that's what we call resting state or spontaneous activity. You have continuous fluctuation and that defines a certain time. That would be your internal time. And that needs to be matched with the external. Thank you, Yer. That's great. Uh, we have some other questions and comments here as well. Um, what about a memory? Uh, where does previous time fit into this, uh, Yer? Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very good question. So you usually memory, usually in neuroscience, particularly in cognitive neuroscience, memory is considered in terms of content. So uh, in one hour, I can retrieve the content that I was seeing you here and giving a talk. Yeah. So, however, more and more. Or maybe there's a deeper layer where you have a temporal layer. Meaning, if I have only short time scales, let's say for half an hour, I will not be able to remember one hour ago that I gave a talk because my brain is lacking the time scales. Meaning, my time scales predispose or shape the kind of contents I can remember or not remember. It's like when you have smaller and larger window sizes. Through the larger window size, you can see something different than through the smaller window size. Same in the case of the time scales. Okay, thank you. Another question, uh, you already touched a little bit, uh, Jörg, in your previous answer to, you, uh, to Gordon about uh, this experimental study you want to do, empirical study. Can you talk a little bit about that experimental design, how it is that you're going to study this uh, phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, in the time scales that you can, for instance, you present external stimuli, uh, but with different speed. Yeah, slow speed, fast speed. So you present the same stimulus with slow and fast speed. Uh, and then you can see how your brain reacts to that. And you can see also individual difference. And then, of course, you hope that you can relate the speed of your external input to the same, to the power in the same speeds of the individual subject. And that degree of matching will probably have an impact how you perceive it. And you could do the same for agents. Okay. Thank you, Jörg. So uh, I know we're getting close to the to the close of our session. So very much appreciate your taking the time to come and share the great research that you've been leading along with your research colleagues. And uh, we very much appreciate your sharing that knowledge with us. And we'd love to have you come back in a few months to maybe share the results of some of these studies and, and the findings from some of these experiments in the future. But on behalf of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum, I'd like to thank you, Jörg, for sharing your, your wisdom and your, and your uh, perspectives with us. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you.